My Family Recipe is a new podcast from Food52 and Heritage Radio Network, bringing you cherished heirloom recipes and the stories behind them. Listen and follow wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to Pizza Quest. I'm Peter Reinhardt, a man on a never-ending search for the perfect pizza. This show is the audio version of the Pizza Talk YouTube series, where I engage in interesting conversations with some of the country's greatest pizza makers and other artisans. Thanks for joining me on this quest. Welcome to Pizza Talk. I'm Peter Reinhardt, and I am here today. We're bi-coastal. I'm on the East Coast in Charlotte, North Carolina. We're with Will Grant, who is in the Pacific Northwest, the great Pacific Northwest, uh, in Kingston, uh, which is close to Bainbridge Island, but a little bit of a uh, uh, of a commute between. But you're at your new pizza restaurant, Sourdough Willie's. But uh, a few years ago, we did an interview on Pizza Quest where you, we talked all about uh, your original pizzeria, the uh, That's a Some Pizza on Bainbridge Island. So you've got yes. two pizzerias now, Will. So we, do, we yes. have a lot to catch up on because it's been a while since since uh, last time I saw you. You didn't have sourdough willies, so no, not at all. You're all about how you got the sourdough willies. But for those who haven't read the interview, and if you didn't get to read that first interview, the written interview in Pizza Quest, just go to pizzaquest.com, uh, look up Will Grant on the search engine, and you'll see that interview. And that and that in itself is really fascinating. But Will, why don't you catch up all the viewers with a little bit of you know kind of your journey in pizza? which has led to, you know, representing the United States on the pizza championship team and winning all sorts of competitions. And also, you know, this sort of, you're one of the pioneers uh, in this country for sourdough pizza. No longer sort of the only only one on the block doing it because now it's become a rage. But uh, it's a big part of, you know, helping to help that tip over. So uh, how did this all get started for you? Well, first off, I want to thank you for inviting me on the show. It's just an honor to be here with you. It's such a Brighter and Glad and, to have uh, that. and with the team of Yodis, I mean, it's pretty amazing to be able to be on a show like this with, with guys I've literally idolized my whole life. <laughs> it's been such a joy for me because I've gotten to meet you know some of the greats and, uh, and luminaries of the of not only the pizza world but the artisan community, which is you know just a gift for me. It is neat to think that uh, we're going around trying to make happiness through food and through pizza, and it does kind of shine through as an art like that. And, uh, for me, it kind of has been a lifelong process. When I was six years old, actually here in Kingston, Washington, my parents opened up Vats of Some Pizza in 1984. And uh, it was a, a wild success. It really all started for them with, uh, my father had been doing different odd jobs. He'd been a, you know, a lumberjack for a while. He had done security. He was a welder on our famous floating bridges here. One of them got hit by lightning and he was a uh, a welder on that bridge and uh, that job came to an end because you know the bridge is running now uh, oh, yeah. we had to look for something new and uh, one of our neighbors and uh, good friends of his was doing backyard pizzas we started kind of doing it together and my, my father was always the kind of guy or you know, someone said i'm doing backyard pizza my dad would say well i'll do one better than you so they started this competition between themselves and they and you know back in the 80s and what they really came upon it, it's kind of funny how he always goes to these competitions he would up with his own recipe, his buddy would do it with their own recipe, and then he kind of meld them together to kind of find something, some kind of something beautiful in the middle. And uh, it really showed through and with how great it was with not only this pizza, but we used our friend's uh, great great grandfather, sourdough starter from the Klondike Gold Rush. And that was at that time 90 years old, and now you know it's that same starter we cook with today is over 125 years old. A lot has happened between your dad starting this thing and you. So he he was really the original sourdough pizza guy then, not you. You got it from him. Absolutely, yeah. No, I was six, and uh, I remember when we opened up that to some pizza, it was such a, you know, there wasn't any pizza in the peninsula over here. You know, really, you know, even Seattle, there's not a big Italian culture here. So there wasn't a lot of pizza here. Yeah. It was Domino's Pizza Hut, uh, but not, not a lot of that kind of in regards to real pizza. So we opened up, and I remember the first day we opened, there was a line two blocks around for this pizza we were making there. And this is right on Bainbridge Island? Island. Something. What's that? On Bainbridge Island? This actually was in Kingston first. We actually started a block away from where I'm at now, which is okay. kind of fun. Kind of coming full, home to Kingston here. Full 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 absolutely. Wow. So we started here in Kingston. There was a line around the block. And one of my funnest stories, really, where I got to know this sourdough starter is uh, – 
after we opened up the first week, I'm oh, sorry, got the, the fog horns from the ferry boats behind me. We're right at the ferry. We love it. It's, it's real, folks. We're, it's in real time. <laughs> <laughs> but so here we are. We opened up. We were just insanely busy. And in the, in the way you do starter, you have to feed it beforehand. And we really wanted to do something special with it. So we were, we were building up a lot and bringing it in. And we ended up running out of starter at the shop. So we had to make a big, ended up being about a uh, 30 uh a gallon trash bucket full of starter at our house. We brought it in and they had, uh, you know, it was the eighties was a little bit of different time. So my job as a six year old was to sit in the bed of the pickup truck, holding up this big <laughs> 30 pound gallon deal of sourdough starter. And it was, you know, July and it was pretty warm. And I remember they just fed it the night before and they didn't know much or they just knew sourdough starter. They knew they feed it and you work with it. They forgot that they doubled and tripled in size. Yeah, that's right. I just remember sitting in the back, this thing, this dirt road, pulling on the top of this thing, and all of a sudden, the top flies off the top and starter starts streaming down the sides of this bucket. And I didn't want to get whooped, so here I am, just trying to drag the sourdough starter with my arms back right. in, right. big fat of starter, and and it was, uh, it was. I remember pulling over the sourdough road, looking at my father, and he was just, and his buddies were laughing at me because here I was. <laughs> A lot of pressure for a six-year-old to, to, to save the starter. Don't lose right, that. Save the starter. <laughs> by the time you got to the by the time you got to the restaurant, you were probably just covered in in covered. Yeah, completely dough. covered. I've spent most of my life covered in sourdough. That's why I was sourdough Willie. I, my I come home a lot and I'll have sourdough all over my arms. My daughter says, "Daddy, what is that?" I said, "Honey, it's sourdough." They don't call me sourdough Willie for nothing. <laughs> that's, that's funny. Well. Uh, when I used to come home from teaching my classes on sourdough, I would have a lot of sourdough starters stuck to my forearm. I'd sit down in my like, uh, you know, like relaxed chair and my cat would jump in my lap and spend the next hour licking the, the starter <laughs> off my arm. That became our bonding moment. You know? Growing happiness, I say. <laughs> but after that it was kind of, it, it revolutionized really the county for pizza for us, where the first kind of small pizzerias, there were a few older ones, but... You know, once we started with Batsy Some Pizza in 84, it kind of blew up. My parents went to immediately to five different restaurants. Um, we had several different pizzerias in the area. It wow. was mainly on the pizzeria takeout side of things. And uh, it wasn't until 88 that my parents wanted to do an upscale restaurant. They wanted to do more of Italian fine dining. So uh -huh. they grabbed me in a suitcase and we did a few Rick Steve seminars because he's pretty local here. And, uh, oh, yeah. We, yeah, we, uh, and we jumped on a plane and we went to uh, Europe for two months and we, we spent Christmas in Denmark, well over France, all over Italy, and all over Germany. And it was really, it was an amazing experience, you know, just to kind of, you know, like I said, there's not a lot of Italian culture around here. So us to really to immerse ourselves over in the yeah. European and Italian culture, it was really a lot of fun. It really inspired me. That's like a trip of a lifetime, really. It was pretty amazing, especially eight years old. And you know, back then, you know, we had several restaurants. So we had the wine distributors set us up. So like, I remember uh, we, uh, you know, Italians eat so differently than we do. We went to the Moretti uh, Beer Factory. And uh, back then they used to do tours. They don't do it anymore. So the owner, you know, came out and, and said hello to us and took us out to lunch in this uh, this amazing little town. I remember they kept asking me, you know, his, actually my parents, does you sound like seafood? Does you sound like seafood? And I said, <laughs> my dad, of course, oh, he'll eat whatever he, you know, he'll eat it, he'll eat it. Well, you know, it's just lunch. They, Americans, we think lunch is a quick meal. Well, in Italy with the Moretti family, it was a nine course lunch of different kind of fish. So I think by about the fifth course, I started liking the fish, but by that time, it's taking the plates out in front of you so quickly, I didn't even get enjoy the full meal. But uh, it was really, it was a neat way to, to be introduced to Italian culture through the sourdough, then through the restaurant like that. It really inspired me to become a chef. So we came back home and we started working on another restaurant that one we called that's some Italian Solmare means by the sea. So that was in Paulsville, Washington. And actually, it still is. And so we opened that up and we actually hired a, uh, a master chef from Sicily, Antonio Mancuso was his name. And he, he came with us and joined us. And actually, I started, I became a chef's apprentice at that point. So I trained with him for about a year and a half. And after that, consecutively, uh, the restaurant business goes, it's always, you know, shuffling through different chefs. I actually apprenticed under five different master chefs there. That's you really where really I got my culinary background with everything. You grew up in a very in the very traditional sense of, of being a restaurant kid to a restaurateur. 
it was traditional but untraditional in America, right? There's, you don't do what your parents did. You don't do what your grandparents did. So true, true. people don't look at it. You always want to try to do better. For me, I just was so proud to be able to do what I was doing. And it was so different. Probably, no, what do you do? Well, I do pizza. Well, that's what your parents do. Like, well, yeah, I like it. It's fun. <laughs> so it was untraditional for Americans, but really in the, in the true tradition. We got a little, yes, uh, little, little Zoom freeze that kind but, of apprenticeship. Like that. So, Will, are those restaurants still in existence? Um, so, we got at one point. This is our this is our thirteenth restaurant we've made. Of all thirteen, we just have the core three. Um, after we did the one in Kingston, we opened one in Bang Island. That one's still open since nineteen eighty four. So, we've had you know that's been thirty six years. And we that's still have that to some Italian Somari in Paulsbo that we've had for thirty one years. now. So now, is this in addition to the pizzerias, or is exactly? This yeah. So we just have that now. It's just sourdough Willie's. That's some pizza, and then that's just some Italian, which is really my mother and her business partner, Marty Lawrence, and then, uh, Tom Pellin have been running that for a long time. So, they, so the family is still sort of a restaurant family. Absolutely. Yeah. My Not father would always just... do the general managing. My mother would do the books, and then our our business partner, Tom Pellin, he would do all the front of the house, and then I apprenticed as the chef with the different chefs. So. We really had a strong team there for a long, long time. But do you, do you put any time in at the other restaurants, or are you focused totally on uh, that's some pizza and and uh, sourdough? Uh, mainly that's some pizza and sourdough willies. Uh, it's just uh, it's a lot of work, and especially with me traveling as much as I do now, it's hard. You know, opening a new restaurant in the middle of COVID, and then keeping you know, our restaurant we've had around for you know thirty six years, keeping it viable, keeping it running well. It's been a struggle, let alone another restaurant top of that. Absolutely is, and uh, uh, but the, uh, are your the two restaurants that you're intimately involved in? Are they part of the restaurant group, or are they independent? And, and, and uh, they're a, a restaurant group of their own. It's that's some pizza incorporated in with Sourdough Willie's Pizzeria, and that's some pizza. But it's just, it's, it's yeah, well, maybe, we, call it group per se. we'll talk about maybe in the second segment a little bit about where, where you see it all going in the future because absolutely lay the foundation for it. Sounds like for growth and expansion too. Yeah, it was well, you know, like I said. And it was in 88 that I really became a, a chef's apprentice. And I spent the next you know, five, six years just trying to become a chef. And I remember that point where I finally, you know, I, I spent a year washing dishes. I spent another year cutting herbs. I spent another year working on sauces and those. Another year working the pantry line. And then my fifth year really working the saute line. I finished everything. My parent, I said, I'm, I'm finally a chef. And my parents said, no, out of the kitchen. You're in the front of the house now. And then I... <laughs> tables <laughs> and then bartending and waiting tables and running the front of the house so i really made my my parents refused to let me call myself a chef i always had to call myself a restaurant tour because that way i wouldn't just get caught in one position at the restaurant yeah focus everywhere with it amazing uh you know opportunity for training to be in in the business to have a chance to work every single position we talked uh, recently with uh, apollonia Paulan who's the daughter of Lionel Poulon, the famous French bread baker. And uh, she was saying the same thing. She grew up in the bakery, literally in the bakery, like you grew up in the restaurant, uh, and, and almost similar kind of jobs, you know, uh, tending the starter and watching and doing every job, front of the house, back of the house, until, you know, the uh, knowing that someday she would have to take over. Absolutely. And, uh, so it sounds like a, a similar situation for you. Yeah, definitely an evolution through the restaurant, for sure, especially with that's some pizza and that's some Italian. But when I first uh, met you and discovered you, so to speak, you connected. I think you wrote to me and we talked, started a conversation about sourdough pizza. It sounded like at that point you hadn't quite yet uh, connected with this greater sort of pizza community, that you were just on the verge of that. Uh, am I correct that, that you weren't part of that? Sort of, well, um, not really. Yeah, not the world yeah. pizza team and being buddies with everyone. I was a big fan of everyone for a long time. I, uh, you know, most of my inspiration comes from Las Vegas these days. It's not just the restaurants there, but it's also the Pizza Expo there. I've been, you know, this year if the, if the Pizza Expo had happened, it would have been I think my nineteenth time going to the. Oh, pizza. so you've really been going for a long time. It wasn't. Yeah, I've been going for a very very long time, but it wasn't until I went to Tony Giuliani's school that I started competing there because I was always you know. It was always a mad dash. So we'd always take, it'd be like either my mom, dad, and I, and our managers. So there'd usually be five or six of us. We'd all go to different seminars. We'd have to take notes. And at the end of the day, we'd have to share all those notes together, really, to, 
to learn as much as we could about it. It was just you know, running the floor, learning the seminars, and there really wasn't time to compete with that. We are just trying to grow as entrepreneurs and really learn as much as we could there. And like thousands of other people who went to Expo, you were really more on the uh, on the learning curve side. You weren't on the on the you weren't one of the presenters. You weren't as known then. You were under the radar, uh, but you Absolutely. were starting to build your network. It sounds like and putting the pieces together, and suddenly you, something happened because you suddenly went from sort of one of the many that go there and paying their dues, so to speak, of learning the craft and the trade, to suddenly being one of the guys now who's doing presentations, winning awards. Uh, so did that, that all happened when you and Tony got together? Is that when Yeah, you well, you know, being, going to as many pizza expos as I had, and, you know, at first I wasn't able to go to these pizza expos. I was too young, and so my mom and dad would go. And I remember one year my mom said, she said, Willie, this kid, Tony Gemiani, he's amazing. He throws these pizzas in the world. They did the Pizza Olympics. It's the most amazing thing in the world. And I just, I heard this story. I was like, oh, my God, I got to go see this. So I finally went to go. And the first year, it was canceled that I was able to go. So I wasn't able to see it at all. So oh. since then, I've been trying to, you know, watch Tony and this team from afar. And it's just amazing what these guys have accomplished and where they've traveled. And starting with the spinning like that and just – being able to watch him grow as a PTO and a person and, and start from acrobatic and end at such an esteemed chef like this too, really. Yeah. So I never thought I could be on this team, but I just, I sure followed it a lot. I went to all his teammates seminars, Len Cybulski, Michael Shepard, you know, all these guys. I really uh, I, you know, admire it and, and follow them a lot as much as I can in my career. And that's where I got all my you know, growth from with those guys. And it wasn't until, you know, my mother had, finally decided to retire at the pizzeria and I just kind of wanted to take things to the next level. I wanted to, you know, she had done so much and spent so long there, you know, keeping it what it was at that point, I think 25 years, I really wanted to, you know, you know, it's easy to, especially when you work in these jobs, as long as we have, it's really easy to get stale and the same thing as that same pizza every night over and over and over again. It's the same brown disc in front of you sh shoveling by the same dough. So I wanted to kind of change things up a little bit. I wanted to learn as much as I could. And I went online and, and, and I looked for the closest pizza schools to me. And, you know, everything was in New York. And then there was Tony's in San Francisco. I was like, well, I got to meet Tony and I got to become a certified pizza guy. Like, this is just heaven for me. I mean, That's right. It's per the perfect situation. Long. It was it was it was a two and one, and plus you know it's on the west coast also, so it's a lot easier for me to get. When did that happen? When did you go to the school? What year? Um, that one in 2017. So it was I went, only a few years ago. That, that yeah, you know, it was the same year. I actually I won best pizza in the nation. It was literally months after that class that I did that, and it was. So that was kind of like two things happening. You're you're going to the school and getting certified and meeting all the sort of the 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 people that have gone before you at the same time you came on their radar because you as an independent operator entered the competition. Was this at Pizza Expo? The, 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 that competition? Uh, it was actually, it was uh, for me, it was prep for the international pizza expo. So I did the pizza and pasta Northwest. Okay. So you did pizza and pasta and then yeah, won, and won the championship there. For yes, pizza. absolutely. I won one of them there. So I got non-traditional. And what was and the pizza? I made the Gorgonzola vegetarian pizza there. That's when I, had, uh, I that, at that point, that pizza was about six years old. And uh, I just was wanting to do something a little different. And uh, we had been making this amazing Gorgonzola dressing for years and years over our salads. And I really liked it as a cream base for our pizzas. So I used that as the base and some mozzarella provolone blend and a little red onions, uh, pine nuts. I really love the way that pine nuts kind of flavor things, and then uh, after the bake, I take a little bit of feta cheese, I like those mushrooms in there. After the bake, I take a little feta cheese and let that residual heat kind of melt down the cheese so it doesn't get too dried out. So it really keeps kind of a chev, a goat cheese kind of consistency. Yeah. It's a kind of a, a, a crisper one. Well, well, plus the fact that you were making it on a sourdough crust, right? And that was Absolutely. probably not, not too many other competitors. No, oh, no, well, it's... For me, it's what I've been doing since I was six years old. That's just the way I've always made pizza. That was one of the struggles actually at the Pizza Expo because there wasn't a lot of guys in sourdough there. It was always very heavier yeast and bread. It's more of that kind of that style of pizza. So I, of all the seminars in the 19 years I've been there, I haven't been to a single dose somewhere there. It was kind of, I learned more at Tony's kind of adapting what I was doing. And actually, I really... 
Tony's school for me was such an, an, an awakening for me, not only as a chef, but as a person. And, and, and so I got to go to Tony's school and I got to meet him. And, and then in the evening time, I walked down the street to Boudin's Bakery, which they have 125 or 130 year old sourdough starter. So here I was learning as much as I could from the top pizza guy in the world. And then going down and learning as much as I could from probably the top sourdough bakery in the world. They have yeah. a very amazing museum there. I love that place. It's on Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so it was just down the block for really, I mean, it was probably six blocks away or maybe yeah. a little bit more from Tony's. But I really took the opportunity there to really learn as much as I could. And, and that, that, that school was pretty amazing that way, just to be able to meet him. And just, you know, I never really thought I know everything. You know, it's, I, I learned a long time ago, actually, that one of the few times I didn't work in a pizzeria, I was actually a long line fisherman in Hawaii. So I, I dropped out of high school. I was working in the restaurant. I wanted to do something new and different. And so I was told that I had a job opportunity in Hawaii. So I went out to Hawaii and became a long line fisherman out there. I wow. spent a whole summer working there. It's pretty amazing. But one of the things I learned there is from these fishermen that had been literally doing this their whole lives, I had a different perspective and I taught them something. And really what, what they told me was it doesn't matter how old you get, that you're always learning something new. And it's that, that second, you think you know it all is when you're irrelevant and that's when someone else is going to come by and learn more than you and do better than you are what you're doing. So it's such a universal lesson. It applies to almost any craft or trade. Absolutely. Um, and so what did you, so what did you teach them that you said that they, you gave them some, some new, new thoughts and they gave you, is that the lesson they gave you was this idea of, yeah, it was a lesson more for me and with that, which is some kind of, well, for me, it was uh, making pizzas in the ovens there. I had, uh, of course, I was the pizza kid and this, uh, this boat and, you know, 300 miles off the coast of Oahu and uh, that we did have a little, uh, run a little foul at this point because uh, the guy that uh, was cooking before me decided every Thursday he would cook a Thanksgiving meal for us. <laughs> Never cleaned the oven. So here I am cooking a pizza at 500 degrees the oven caught on fire 300 miles from the coasts. So it was kind of a, not a good predicament to be in. Luckily we got it out, but we didn't have a uh, hot meals for the rest of that uh, trip out on the water. But uh, it was just even cleaning up after ourselves, you know, in a fishing boat, they're really, you have to be immaculate with the way you clean things. Not only are you cleaning the kitchen daily, you're cleaning the decks, you're using osphilic acid on the decks to wipe off all that rust and stuff like that. So, for him, he had learned from me that even the inside of the oven need to be clean, detailed, you know, and as opposed to the whole deck, there's, there's so many different pieces. To it yeah, well, you know, uh, those of us in the restaurant business know how hard that is, what a hard, hard, you know, business it is to be a restaurateur. Um, and, but being a fisherman is pretty damn hard, too. <laughs> I mean, it, it may be harder, you know, I talk about the, 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 the challenges of life. Being out Absolutely. there in the ocean and then to have a fire on top of it. Um, exactly. So you had some interesting uh, sort of stops along the way in your own quest to become who you are. This this uh, trip to Italy as a kid to kind of like, you know, and then apprenticing and then actually weaving in this, this sort of, uh, what would you call it, a uh, little uh, side side trip to uh, as a fisherman. And then right. bringing all those le life lessons back into what you're doing now. Well, it's been interesting, too. It's really been, it's come full circle for me. Uh, in 2017, when I won, then Tony uh, added me to the team, you know, which is a personal invite to the team. This isn't just any chef. This is the top chefs in the world that personally are invited by Tony to join the team. It's just an honor that I could do, and I never thought would happen. And uh, then the first thing I do with him, you know, here I am with these you know, the guys at the top of the industry. What's the first thing we do? We go to Italy, we go to school, and we learn how to make a Rogan pizza at Cal Mill over in Italy. And it was just a full circle. It was literally 30 years from when I was 10 years old to, you know, here we are going to Italy again with Tony Gemignani and you know, the World Pizza Champion team going to some of these same cities we had gone to and being able to, just the perspective 30 years later. Was really, uh, so, really so you're, Are you in your 40s now? I am, I'm 43. Okay, so look, you're, <clears throat> pardon me, but you are basically a young man. You, but when you describe your journey, you've had to be patient along the way. You've had amazing stuff of five years here and, and, and every, another year learning this part of the restaurant and another year, and it sounds like an awful lot. And, and yet these days, young people want to have all of those skill sets and life skills, you know, by the time they're 27 years old. Right, and I, yeah. What I, you know, what I'm getting out of this conversation is, is, is you know, 
you can learn an awful lot and you're just now entering your prime. You've, you've kind of consolidated all of these skills and lessons and, and you're just hitting your prime. You're just kind of like ready to take off and now opening up a new, a new restaurant, the Sourdough Willie. Absolutely, Willy. yeah. So uh, how long has Sourdough Willie's been open? Uh, two months now. So really new. It's and, uh, really, really new. It's, it's been a great time to open, right? Right in the middle of the COVID. It's, uh, it's been interesting. You know, it's, it's been two years in the making for us. This was, you know, like I said, this is the 13th restaurant I made before. It isn't my first time opening a restaurant, but for a project like this, you know, after winning the award, joining Tony on the team, we knew it was time to kind of, it was time to really start investing in ourselves again. You know, what, yeah. what better bet than ourselves and you know, we have control over what's happening. So we started looking around for buildings and we found this one, which is really a fantastic location, but the, the business itself wasn't in a good state. It was a, an old fish fry restaurant with a tavern in the back that had been there for 30 years. And the owner was pretty burnt out with it. But uh, so he, we, first we just bought the restaurant and then we actually were able to convince him to sell the whole building here. So actually where we're at now, you can kind of see behind me there, it's, it's we can't see because there's thick fog this morning. It's going to be in the 70s later today, but it's uh, there's a ferry terminal that runs to, they actually have two ferries out of there. One goes to downtown Seattle and one goes to uh, Edmonds, Washington. So it's uh, it's really an amazing location and it's, you know, the, the views when they're in the back, so we're only halfway done even completing it. Two years later, it's uh, we've got the pizzeria side done, but there's a whole back dining room and a bar and and, uh, and it's, actually, I have another Porto Bravo and Napolitano pizza back there, and we're putting a already morning back there. And so we're going to actually be uh, adjusting to a little bit of a school. I want to do it my own there. But uh, you can, from the dining room, you can see Mount Rainier with the ferry boats in front of it and Space Needle. It's really, really a beautiful view here. It's really nice. So for right now, you're already open to the public, right? Yeah, so the front half, the, the slice house is open to the public. The back bar and uh, pizza bar are still, they're probably about another month, month and a half out. So, uh, so your business is really people coming up and, and, and uh, walk away, you know. Or, or, take out, yeah. We only have a few bar seats here. And then with uh, Washington State's regulations, you can only be at half uh, seating capabilities. But at the same time, you can't have uh, any bar seats. So. Pizzas take out anyways, and luckily out in front here, there's a big park next to the ferry terminal so people can grab their pizzas. And a lot of people will just get, will just walk on the boat from uh, Seattle or Edmonds and just take the afternoon over, grab a pizza, have a bite to eat, and just take the ferry boat right back home. That's great. Well, I know you have a, you were going to show us a couple pizzas today, some of your... Uh... Uh, was it your, you're going to show us that championship pizza that you made? I you? am, yeah. I wanted to start right. off with another one too. Let me. Uh, well, why don't we do this? Why don't uh, let's describe what you're going to do? What you're going to do? We're going to we're running out of time in this segment, so we're going to take a little break. You'll tell us a little bit what you're going to make. We'll take a break. When you come back, we'll spend the second segment making a couple of uh, of your championship pizzas. Perfect. Yeah, I'm going to be making the uh, the Detroit style New Yorker, which is our new most popular pizza here at Sourdough Willie's. It's a uh, something I take a lot of inspiration on from Tony Gemiani and my travels with him. And then also I'll be making my New York style uh, Gorgonzola vegetarian, where I've kind of tweaked the recipe a little bit here at this location, because as you know, sourdoughs change in different climates. Yeah. And yeah. Being this close to this humidity and the fog here, it's going to change our starter. And I'll actually, uh, show you, I won't feed the starter, but I'll show you what the starter looks like after feeding, after uh, we get a fermentation process of about, I think about 12 hours right now. Is the Detroit style that you're doing also made on the sourdough crust? Everything yes, yeah, all our doughs are done with sourdough here. All, well, that's, all and that's kind of, a, you know, that's not commonly seen yet, although I imagine it's going to grow as a category. I think so, absolutely, especially because I do a really wet, I do, I think right now most people are doing like a 76, or not even that, I think most people are doing like a 70 to 60 to 70 percent hydration on the Detroit Sicilian styles. I'm doing an 80 percent hydration on all my uh, dogs. I love hearing that. Yeah, that's why I love to do it too. That's 80 percent where I work at with, uh, with my Detroit side. I just think it, it just makes everything better. when it's it does. it does. My mom has a term for it. She calls it sea foam. Is what it's like working with with a fully proof dough ball of that eighty percent. Gotta trademark that, man. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> all right. So, Will, we're going to take a break. We want to invite all of you viewers to come back for part two. Will's going to show us uh, two of his pizzas, and maybe in the process we'll get to see the the, the setup here at the at the new sourdough Willie's in Kingston, and uh, uh, you know, come back. We'll be right back with more Pizza Quest right after this break. Good food is worth a thousand words. 
This is Arti Menon, and I'm delighted to share a new podcast with you. My Family Recipe from Food 52 and Heritage Radio Network. Adapted from Food 52's much-loved column of the same name, the My Family Recipe podcast will bring its pages to life. Each episode of My Family Recipe brings you a cherished heirloom recipe and the story behind it from voices across the world of food. We'd open these tubs of dough and they would exhaust these incredible yeasty fumes and it just smelled like nothing else. It was so intoxicating. I'll interview writers and chefs, parents and children, about what's passed down along with the foods that we know and love. Chinese people aren't like born with a download on how to like velvet chicken. You know, like that's not something that just like comes to you. Listen and follow wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Pizza Talk. We're with Will Grant at Sourdough Willie's in Kingston, uh, Washington State. Uh, and he is about to assemble a couple pizzas for us in his brand new pizzeria. I'm uh, already. I'm as we, you're, you're making it. We, we want to learn about that that cool oven that you've got uh, uh, spinning around behind you. But uh, which pizza are you going to do first, Will? First, I'm going to do my New York style uh, gorgonzola vegetarian, the one I won at uh, the uh, Caputo Cup and non traditional. Beautiful. So this is an award winning pizza. Which is this on the menu also? At, at, it uh, is. Yes, I have this on the menu at all my restaurants. The, the, the menus do differ at uh, both That's a Sub Pizza and Pino's Pizza, or sorry, older restaurant, Sourdough Willie's Pizza. Yeah. I've had too many restaurants, I can't remember all the names. So that looks like a pretty good sized piece of uh, dough there, that, that, that dough ball. How, how much is it weigh? 24 ounces. Oh, that's a big pizza. Uh, so this is a 16 inch pizza. A lot of people have different techniques for opening dough. I kind of found, uh, I do a, a hand toss like this that works really well for me. Looks good. It's working good. That dough is pretty uh, extensible. Yeah, well, it's uh, a big part of my dough is really making sure it's warm, especially with the sourdough. You really got to make sure it's active. And then uh, I've made a few changes to the recipe where I use uh, diacetic malt instead of sugar in all my recipes. And, uh, I actually mill my own. So I actually uh, have a mock mill and I mill up all my own malts here. It's kind of fun. So it gives it a really... Uh, a really neat texture. You can kind of see the husks in there. And so basically, uh, when you say you mill your own malt, so you're basically buying uh, malted barley, yes. and then and then and then grinding it in your mill to make a powder. Exactly. And what effect is that? Was that diastatic malt? Diastatic means that the malt's still active with the enzymes. So it's exactly. Not, yeah. So not it's diastatic out. compared to non-diastatic is that the fact that we actually get to have a, a more. Uh, living enzymes to natural sugar as opposed to refined sugar. And it actually, because of that, it actually helps break down sugars faster in uh, starters with flours than it does with regular sugar. It gets the, the my friend Carl DeSmet describes it much better than I do, but it actually breaks it down in the cells by two immediately, as opposed to where it does a, a it'll go, I think, you know, 11 or 12 uh, at, with sugar, as opposed to it goes directly down with this diastatic malt. So it actually does the fermentation process. It's much quicker here, which when you're dealing with a thousand square foot kitchen, and you really got to make sure you can get your, your fermentation right. It's all about timing. Yeah, yeah. So God, we'll keep building it, but I'll keep asking you questions as you go. Yeah, um, absolutely. So you mentioned Carl DeSmet, who we're going to have in, in, in our next season of Pizza Talk, because we're, uh, we're kind of coming to the end of season one. Uh, but we're going to bring Carl back. He is the proprietor of the Curado Sourdough Library in, in uh, Saint Vif, Belgium, where they where they house about 125 starters from around the world. And I'm guessing, since you're friends with Carl, that your starter is one of those 125. It is number 104 at the Sourdough Library. And Sourdough Library. That's pretty. That's a cool honor. Um, it's 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 a it's a very big honor, and it's uh, it's neat. Actually, last time I went and competed with Tony Gemiani, actually he wasn't competing. I was competing in London. And when I was in London, I went and uh, I took the uh, train after the meeting with the team, and we went and uh, got to visit Carl Smet in the Sourdough Library. It was just, it was really, really cool. I mean, you went from, from London, took the, 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 the channel over? Yes, and then, yeah. And took the train and, over to, uh, through Paris and into Belgium. And so you drove all the way to, into, into, into Belgium? Uh, we just took the train, and then actually uh, Carl picked us up at the train terminal there. 
and, and St. Vith is in Belgium, but it's not near Brussels. It's actually closer to Germany than it is. It is, yeah. It's, just, it, it's such an amazing country, Belgium. They speak three different languages there. Yeah. They're in the middle of everything. So what do you put in? It has, I think, like four, like three-star Michelin restaurants in a town of less than 1,000 people. I mean, it's just, amazing. it's pretty amazing. What, what are you putting on there right now? So these are uh, sliced thin button mushrooms. Step out of the way. Next, I'm we'll putting on some more sliced thin red onions. Underneath that, you had put some cheese down first, right? Was that mozzarella cheese? That was my mozzarella provolone blend. I like to use. Oh, provolone right blend. Okay. And then you put a cup, and then you squeeze some some sauce. What was that sauce? This is that uh, homemade gorgonzola dressing I was talking ah, about. Ah, so that's okay. That's one of your secret ingredients, basically. Yes, absolutely. It's uh. It's, is this going to be one of the pizzas? Is this one of the ones you're submitting for the for the new P, uh, Pizza Quest pizza book? It is, yes, absolutely. All right. Good. But Good. I think you were one of the judges over there in uh, at that year also at the uh, at Caputo I, Cup. I was a judge at the Caputo Cup in New York City. Is that where you were? You won? No, I won in uh, Jersey. Oh, I okay. oh that that was the next year. That's right, the following year. Yeah. I did. I did judge, and I wow, I completely forgot. What I, all I remember is, is I ate so many pizzas that day that when I left, I said, I don't think I can ever do this again. Yeah, I did. I judged for the Caputo Compass last year. It was a lot of pizza. A lot of pizza. And, and the thing is, it sounds like the dream job. And if you have self-discipline, like you can eat one bite and move on, that's one thing. But I don't. If I eat a slice of pizza, I feel like I have to eat the whole slice. And before you know it, you're kind of maxed out. Yeah, before you know it, you're eating 20 full pizzas. That's right. What are you, what are you putting on now? So that was minced garlic, and I have a great way. I can use my hand like a shaker. I'll take a little dollop, and I'll shake it over there. I really evenly distribute it. Nice, nice. Yeah. We'll go ahead and throw this guy in. We have the gorgonzola vegetarian. So it's essentially a white pizza, no red sauce. Yeah, uh, exactly, yeah. And, and it's baked on a, <clears throat> on a rolled-out New York-style crust, basically. So uh, it's, it's, it's really – you sell this by the slice at the at – the, yes. Yeah, we do everything by the slice here on top of doing it by the pizza. Uh, here at Santa Willie's, we only do eight pizzas, but you have the choice of three different crusts. We give you New York style, Sicilian style, or Detroit style. So it's a neat wow. variation on each style of pizza also. A reason for people to come back every day. Right? So we are putting this in this beautiful Rotoflex oven. Beautiful. I love that. So you, you leave it in the pan. You bake it in the pan on the, on the Rotoflex. On the disc, yes. Well, you found it's easier, you know, you can put it straight on the, uh, the hearth in there, but we find it's easier to train people actually using that, kind of, using a screen like that. It's always a uniform round, you know. As much as I love being an artist and all a pizza maker, this is a business and it's all about consistency. That's right. Yeah. My, my dad used to say, uh, uh, Willie, if people don't like uh, McDonald's because it's a good burger, it's a crappy burger, but it's the same crappy burger wherever you go in the world. Right. <laughs> they, they count on that. They count on that uh, being the same everywhere. Do, yeah. And so that was our going to bed. Yeah, we're running to set a timer real quick. How long will it bake? Uh, that takes about seven minutes in this oven. Perfect. Well, while that's baking, you can start the second pizza. Yeah. And so this is my parbate crust for my Detroit style. Wow. Beautiful caramelization. The sourdough, sa uh, sourdough Detroit style crust. Okay, it's about an inch and a half thick. Exactly. And we, uh, so the, how we do this still, I kind of do it more in a, a Roman style fashion than I even do a Detroit style fashion. Whereas I, uh, we bulk ferment it and we, uh, for four days and I use an 80% hydration in it. So it's a lot wetter than what most people use. And, uh, I know I just fell in love spending all this time over in Rome and, uh, in Italy with Tony and the team. I really, enjoyed learning as much as I can from these different you know, Italian pizza masters. We, uh, last time we went to Rome, we went to Capo di Fiero. There was a, uh, we went to a 300 year old uh, pizza or bakery that's serving pizzas that does Roman style pizzas for five Antico generations. Forno. Antico Forno, I've been there. Yes, yes. Yeah, I love that place. And they only make two yeah. kinds of pizza, red and white. <laughs> yes, I got to make a pizza there also. I got to uh, load one in the oven. I just destroyed it. It was horrible because the the accordion and up on there, you yeah. put on the paddle, you pull it out. Well, I got the back stuck on it, so to pull it out, we ripped it out. So instead of a meter long, it's about two meters long. It looked like some giant anime sword. And one of my favorite <laughs> pictures from the trip was actually me outside and them showing me this horribly disfigured pizza. Just 
pointing and laughing in it and pointing and laughing at me. But, you know, I'm sure that you were you were a bundle of laughs for them. They probably talked about it for days afterwards. I think so. It was you know, what an honor even you know, to be in a 300-year-old bakery to, to do something like that. But an honor, destroy a pizza. an honor to be humiliated in their bakery. <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> well, it's not like I'm going to teach them anything, right? right. I mean, well, that, well yeah. I met the, the, the master baker there came to Pizza Expo last year. And a uh, uh, great guy, and he was making them. I have photos of his pizzas that he was making at Pizza Expo, and just beautiful because they 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 puff up and they've got this beautiful uh, large aeration structure. Yes, inside. absolutely. It's all about how it's amazing. That's the same dough as this, but it's all about how you prepare the dough and how you open the dough. Yeah, it's like a big, yeah. big difference. So all right. Here's our Detroit style. We have a mix of a uh, Wisconsin uh, brick cheese, aged white cheddar, and a little bit of mozzarella cheese in there. Awesome. And uh, uh, brick, of course, is the most traditional or, you know, sort of associated with the Detroit style. But Absolutely. places can you can even get brick these days. But uh, yeah. and, and I do they do what you do. They blend it with cheddar, which gives it a little bit more acidity and edge. And then the mozzarella with the... the well, it's, yeah, it's amazing. I found that the mozzarella leaves such great crowns also. We'll see at the end of this. And then the bake, you can see the crown it leaves. The mozzarella adds so much in there. And then I'm using a cup and char pepperoni on this one. So that'll, that'll cup up on us when it bakes. So you're really going pretty much classic Detroit, except for the fact that you're doing it on your dough, which is sourdough, which you're not going to see that at Buddy's or, uh, you know, some of the, uh, the old, old school places. Exactly, yeah. And, so I, and then I am really, uh, besides doing my sourdough, I am really trying to, you know, source all the right ingredients for it, too. I want to kind of honor Detroit, you know. But this isn't true Detroit because my sourdough, but it's, you know, it's my homage to buddies yeah. in places like that. Exactly, exactly. We have some pinched uh, Italian sausage here as well. Now, now you're trying to get into a meat lover's. Yeah, well, I tell you what, it's pretty amazing pizza. And, this and guy over here, no, no sauce, so do you sauce it when it comes out of the oven? Yes. So that gum line is really hard to achieve and get, the, you know, with that dough right there, that's a 13-ounce dough ball that we've risen for four days. Uh, we pressed it out, did another cold rise for another 24 hours, and then we did an overnight uh, rise for 18 hours to get it to the you know, triple in the size. We bake it off. So if I were to put sauce underneath that cheese there and trap that moisture with that dry, just really make a soggy kind of not really feeling right. pizza. So I bake it off, then over the top we'll do strips of a pizza sauce over it. I'm sure through trial and error, you had to figure a lot of that out. Because yes. I did not. Uh, because I went to Tony's school, and I found out about these Detroit pizzas. And I, yeah. I actually, after I opened this place, I actually called up both uh, Tony and Jeff Smokovich, and I said, why did you not tell me the rest of my life I'm pushing out Detroit-style crusts? Because <laughs> I think at that point, we only had two employees, and we were here literally until midnight every night pushing out all the doughs. So since then, we've kind of worked on it. You can see in here, there's the uh, rotating around our New York style up there. You can see how it's uh, leavened up on the edges. And these are, uh, this kind of oven's called a Rotoflex oven. Oops. Love it. It's, a, it's such a beautiful oven. The stones are so... You know, to see round stones kind of, uh, you know, moving through the oven like that. It's, it's really neat. It's, uh, you know, uh, we had used the same laying air door ovens for, I think, 20, uh, right around 25 years. And in those pizza ovens, you could fit 12 pizzas and cook them in 15 minutes, you know, because you had to rotate everything around and, and the heat, as opposed to this oven, you know, there's uh, several different things. One, there's two doors to it. So we can load on one side and take oh. out on the other. Oh. So you're not kind of crawling all over each other and stuff. Yeah. And yeah. then because of the stones, we can fit five per shelf. So we're doing about 25 pizzas in seven minutes here compared to... Do you have that and you don't have to rotate it to get an even bake because it's rotating itself. And oh, the big plus. So how many shelves are there in your oven? There are four in this oven. I'm going to pull this down here. Yeah. I've seen them, I think, as high as six, but uh, four is quite an hour. Quite a, quite yes. a <laughs> I think Rotoflex only does four for these kind of ovens. I know there's some Greek ovens and some other ones that manufacture some other ones as well. Really? Interesting. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and you do all your pizzas in that oven? Yes, we do everything in there. We have a, you know, we have another Moretti Forney oven that we have over, you can kind of see in the background right there, right there, backwards, I was weird that we use for when we're actually making the Roman style pizzas. 
I went to a class with uh, Massimiliano Siva yes. down in Florida, and he's amazing, yeah. Yeah. amazing Pizziolo, and then just his, his, his process was so neat to learn, and that's kind of how he used, so I, I had to start using those myself. Have you introduced the Roman styles to your menu? We did uh, sandwiches at first, but when we first opened up, people really weren't interested in sandwiches here. They were interested in the pizza. I mean, it was, we were selling out every single night for two weeks, like I said, so uh, we, it was just kind of nuts. So we had to, we were pushing out all these doughs every night. So I had to double our pan. So we have about uh, 150 pans now. And just people just are going nuts for this Detroit style and Sicilian style. And, and I was really blessed to uh, my local uh, NBC affiliate came actually at our two week mark here and did a big expose on us. So <laughs> Northwest just in the region. And, you know, with COVID times, you know, you can't go to Europe, you can't go to Cali, but you can go get a pizza at your pizzeria. So we're getting people from all over the state driving up just to try our pizza because they saw us on TV. Well, I'll tell you, it just tells you the power of pizza because the, the pizza restaurant community has pivoted probably better than any other segment. And, uh, and the public is, you know, proving that what we always knew, which is that everybody right. loves well, we have a, you know, it's perfect for takeout. Excuse me for a second. I'm going to have to get this pizza out of the oven. All right. We want to see that. So it travels well. You, you have Neapolitan style pizzas. They don't travel well. Sourdough, thicker crust pizzas, they retain the heat a lot better as well. So when you've got a quality product that people want to try, this is, this is what they're going to try. Did you say earlier that you're go that you are going to be setting up a wood fire oven as well? Yes. So I have already purchased a new uh when we're done over here, I'll show you the other side. Uh, I have a whole uh, full liquor bar, and then half of it's going to be liquor, and then the other half is going to be that Moretti 40 and the Porno Bravo over there. And I actually want to do a little school over there. I want to do the Pacific Northwest School of Pizza there. And That's actually, awesome. I talked to the Academy Pizzioli to be doing their first uh, Italian pizza school here in the United States also. So, You're going to do it right there at the, at the restaurant? Yeah, absolutely, just like Tony does. I, I just... <laughs> It's amazing to see how he inspired me and, and the confidence he gave me with what he was doing. And I just really want, I want to share that also. It's, it's such a neat, like you see, you talk about these pizziotis sharing things, you know. There's, there's not many people I look at more to than like Tony Gianni and John Arena. Just their philosophies on life and sharing. And it's so much of a philosophy. Even with sourdough starter, you're, you're, you're growing happiness, right? Like we take the starter, we feed it to create this dough that feeds these other doughs. Actually, I think of it more of you're feeding the sourdough starter into the pizza dough as opposed to using it in the pizza dough. So for me, I'm growing this pizza for people to enjoy and spend time with their family at home. So in a sense, growing happiness here, especially in American culture. People don't sit down to eat together a lot, right? It's go, 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 go. So when they get a chance to all sit together and have a family experience, they're doing that over our pizza. So I think it's a really powerful thing, especially in this day and age. I think that you've mentioned that phrase, growing happiness, a few times. That's got to be the sort of almost the motto of the restaurant. You ought to have that on your sign. Yeah, it's uh, the culture of culture, right? So here we uh, got our uh, gorgonzola veggie. Beautiful. Do you do any, do you, when it comes out of the oven, do you garnish it with anything? What's that? You garnish it with anything? Or is yes, it ready? I'll be putting the feta cheese. I'm just going to cool off for a second. I'm going to take a look at this. Uh, New Yorker over here. Let's see how she's doing. You can see here, she's not quite ready yet. We can see the, the cheese edges, a little bit of the crown. I'm not sure if you can uh -huh. see it. Oh, it's, it's climbing up the pan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And what we're looking for is really kind of a, a foamy texture to the cheese that actually kind of separates and starts browning over the top. So we're going to leave that in for a few more minutes while we uh, dress this uh, burning salt veggie. It looks like you've, you've you've done this before. You've got everything kind of timed very nicely here. I'm trying to. It's you know that's what a chef does, right? It's all about timing. Well, that's it. I mean, salad you know. after the uh, entree or the or the dessert before the salad. Well, you you've you've paid your dues over the years, so you you know it's it's in, integrated into your into your flesh basically. Thank you. Yeah, I know it's just it's a part of what I do. It's just it's like you said. It's been doing it so long. It's just. Second nature, kind of to me. It's right. Nice. There's, there's the booty shot I was showing you there. It was uh, beautiful. Yeah, the caramelization. The great undercrust, the underskirt. Yes, the booty shot. 
Everybody is. I, mean, I never heard it called the booty shot, but that's just right. It's everybody's favorite Instagram sort of. Uh, right. I call yeah, it, it's I call it the, the food porn shot. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a. Uh, it's a great pizza. It, you know, when I competed with this, I just I wanted to do something that I was proud of that I had kind of come up on my own. You know, I didn't come with the sour or with the. Uh, with the dressing or the starter, but you know, the recipe with the starter, I can't put my own and then the recipe for the pizza. So you cut that into what, six slices? Uh, when I do my slices, I do six. When for a full pizza, I'll actually do it in eight slices. So, so what, and what do you sell a slice for when, when someone- 450. 450? Uh-huh. That's good, that's a good price. Oh, yeah. Portion of some, uh, some feta cheese. So it's really important when you're using feta cheese like this, I dry it out as much as possible and I put it in a food processor. Really, it gets it really airy and light and fluffy uh -huh. also. So I'm just gonna. That adds not only uh, the wonderful cheese flavor, but a little bit of saltiness to it. Exactly, yeah. And then like you said, the, uh, the texture to it also. Is that the same thing going on in the second container? Then we can uh, see how already the uh, yeah. And the residual heat is melting that feta cheese. It's really a, it's a fun pizza. I'm really proud of it. Yeah, the layers of flavor and uh, wonderful look the structure. Yeah, great. Look at the way it aired up. All sourdough, no, no commercial yeast, 100% natural leavening, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Beautiful. And, and that's a fun pizza. That's the that Gorgonzola vegetarian. That is how you won the Caputo Cup Championship. The guy is onto the world championship team that went to Italy. And it just, it's funny how, you know, one victory can open up so many other learning lessons for you. It's pretty amazing. And I got really lucky too, because not only did I win first place in non-traditional style, but my manager using my dough won second place in traditional. So we actually were the top ranked pizzeria in the nation for a year because of that. I remember, I remember that. Yes, now it's coming back. I and, uh, there was a mess up the scoring at first, so we didn't know that my manager had gotten second place. What's his name? Is it Raymond Allen is his name. Raymond, is he still working with you, Everett? Uh, uh, unfortunately, no, he is not. Uh, too bad. So here we are with, you can see how it's foamed up on top. You got the beautiful, yeah. so let's see. The fact that you, that you baked that on a, on a par-baked, crust uh, shorten the baking time. Yeah, so that, it shortens the baking time and then with such a high hydration dough also, there's really no way to put toppings on 80% hydration dough. It just would deflate in there. Yeah, yeah. So all I need to do is gonna get my pour in here, lift it up, see that crown. Wow. And the frico around the edge. Great color. Great caramelization. Thank you. Yeah, very, very dramatic with the crown. You and I, uh, you you must be friends with Justin De Leon. Yes, because <laughs> yes. he showed us his uh, at, at uh, Apollonia, Apollonia's. You know, he's famous for his crowns, and his, I think his Instagram shots are all about the those those dramatic crowns that he gets. Yeah, it's pretty amazing stuff for sure. This is a fun yeah. pizza. This, so I take it a lot. Like I said, a lot of inputs with Tony in this one. With the, you would call it the New Yorker, but uh, it's, a, it, it's a fun idea with this Roman and these different pan sal pizzas that is such a different process than what we're used to, you know. Yeah. With, that, uh, with my Gorgonzola vegetarian, we ended up doing all of our, uh, sorry about the light behind me, doing, uh, you know, everything before time, you know, or great right before, as opposed to the pan style, you know, it's a wetter dough, it's a longer process, you know, I think... Yeah. To mix New York style dough, it only takes me 10, 12 minutes. To mix an 80% pan style dough, it takes me a little over an hour. Because really? adding in the water to the flour, you have to take your time. You have to make sure the heat doesn't get too hot with it. You don't want that bowl friction, you know, destroying, you know, getting over, you know, 70 degrees of that thing. So you got to keep some ice water in there, do it slowly, kind of let it, because I've done it before I tried throwing everything at once, it's just the soup. And that's actually one of the biggest things I've learned with Tony, going to Italy, going to Italian Mail, going to Cassidy Piano, learning about how, you know, the different styles and the different absorption rates of these different flowers also. I'm really blessed here in Washington State to have shepherd's grain flour, which is a locally farmed and milled flour, which is really, really special, I think, to be able to, to have 
people walk in the door and say, oh, I, I go for Shepherd's Gray. Let me see your bag of flour. And you look the side of the bag of flour and it said, you look up online, it was their farm. So literally they got to eat a pizza made from their flour and they, you know, they were nice. able to drive the three hours here to do it. Washington State has really, uh, really taken the lead, I think, in creating regionally specific, you know, strain yeah. wheat and and all the work that's being done in Washington State. Yeah, the bread lab there, with the, what they do for farmers too. And it's, you know, as a, as a chef and a restaurateur, as a person, you want to support your neighbors, support local people. So being able to support local farmers like that, that's that's really strong. That resonates in everything you really do. I mean, to, yeah. especially in a worldwide economy is falling apart like this, when you can support someone down the street. Like I don't sell any big brand beers or anything like that. I only support local breweries, local distilleries and stuff like that too. It's, right. it's, it's a way to, you know, help your own economy. You know, being a restaurateur, you realize you go to a restaurant, it's a chain, you give them your money, those tax dollars are going somewhere else. If you stay to a local mom and pop place, you support someone locally, that gets supported locally here and you oh, support yeah. yourself. You put it all in the community. So you, you still have to put some sauce on that, right? Yeah, so you can see I've been uh, heating up this uh, sauce for a little bit. He is hot sauce also. You don't want to do a colder sauce. And that was where we do the uh, the racing stripes, right? That's what uh, Fauci, first I better cut this thing. Why do you call this the New York? Uh, this is called the New Yorker. And it's kind of funny when I do it on the New York style crust, it is the New York New Yorker. But uh, yeah. But is it the New Yorker because of the pepperoni? Is it? Is it it's because uh, it's homage to Tony Gemiani's New Yorker pizza. That's really I where see. it comes from. Yeah. I gotcha. Okay. So, so we take uh, our slices. Now, and I'll, I'll sauce it differently too. If I'm going to do it by the slice, I'll just do a little dollop on each piece of pizza uh, there, yeah, rather than stripes. Yeah, because it's a better presentation. You're pulling out of the slice warmer. It's uh, sure. yeah, it's all one piece like this. I'll do a. Uh, on the one side, uh, I'll do dolls. On the other side, I'll do the racing stripe. That's the racing stripe, even to the point all of our cheese pizzas be called the red top, because that's supposed to be the, the racing red tops in, a, right. in Motor City. And then for the slice, I'll kind of go like that. Oh, man. And then we do a little Giffinato basil. I wish I could reach through that screen right now. No, where where is uh, Willy Wonka's smell vision when you need it, right? Exactly. <laughs> it is different out of basil. We're working on that app right now. <laughs> <laughs> then this is a, one of the things I learned from Tony. It's doing uh, a pastry bake with a little mix of ricotta cheese. And now we're taking it to another level. Um, they always say that, you know, that uh, cooking is taking ingredients and doing something to them. But gourmet cooking is taking ingredients and doing something to them and then doing something else to them. And this right, is yeah, something else now. This is that little like today it's all about after. And also, you know, it's all about sweet and salty too. That being said, uh, this Mike, amazing Mike's hot Mike, honey here. Honey. Boy, Mike's is showing up. Mike's getting a lot of product placement in these videos because a lot of people are using his honey now. It's a, it's a pretty neat product. products. I have one of those squeeze bottles at home too, and I'm putting it on everything. I even put it on blueberries. <laughs> Right. Ooh, that sounds amazing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A buddy of mine with King Umberto, they even make uh, drinks with it. That's a pretty kind of neat idea also. That's so a here beauty. we have. That's a beauty. The New Let's Yorker. Real close so we can see that structure. Look at that. The, 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 the caramelized crust, the, the nice spongy interior probably melts in your mouth, right? Like almost like, cr like cream. Exactly. Beautiful. Wow. I uh, love that shot, man. You just you just out Instagrammed Instagram there with that. <laughs> oh man, Will, thank you so much for making those. And, Absolutely. Uh, uh, and we really, it's it's been exciting having you on, hearing the story, hearing about uh, you know the part that I didn't remember was how many years you spent at every station and learning piece by piece the trade, the craft. Uh, and and still and and this is the, I think for me the big takeaway of today is to, to realize folks that uh, put in the time early don't be in such a rush to get it all figured out right away uh, learn the craft and by the time you get all the pieces put together and you've connected the dots you're still young enough to like now 
you know, kind of move into the next act. In Absolutely, your yeah. That's that's what I'm kind of doing here with Sardo Willies and uh, School Pacific Northwest School of Pizza and Academy Pizza or Academy Pizzioli as well. It's uh, it's kind of building on everything. It's all about layering, just like a pizza. You got to start with your good base, your good sourdough. You got to find a good mozz. You got to go find that perfect mix of cheese, that provolone. You got to be able to find, you know, the right toppings that really fix it as well. Even like in my ingredients, even my dough, a lot of people use a, a extra virgin olive oil. It's too strong for me. I like milder oils of mine. It overtakes that sourdough flavor. So finding what works for you and just plan on playing the long game. That's, that's what we're all here for. The short game gets you nothing. The long game is really where, where things can really fly. That's a great lesson. And also just the fact that you, you kind of, you've, you've trained and thought globally, but you act locally. And I love that. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on here. It's been uh, quite an honor. Well, folks, thanks for joining us. Will Grant and uh, well, at Sourdough Willies, but also at, uh, um, uh, that's that's, a, that's a some pizza. How did, that, some pizza. That, and that was that was your your mom and dad started. That's a some pizza like forty years ago, and it's and now uh, you know Will has taken everything in the pizza side to a whole other level by basically putting in the work, uh, putting in your ten thousand hours, as they say, you know, to <laughs> and and uh, honoring what Tony said, which is to uh, is to uh, you know respect the craft. Respect which, the craft, absolutely. Yeah, it's, that's I think should be everyone's motto. Whatever you do, do the best job you can at it, and you're going to go from there. Well, it's great to see you again, Will, and uh, congratulations on all your success on your growth. And I look forward to seeing you at whenever we can get the tribe back together. Whether it be again, a green conference or a pizza expo. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Whatever comes first, I'll be seeing you. And thank Absolutely. you all for joining us on Pizza Talk. We'll see you on the next episode. And, and hopefully we're going to get one or one of Will's pizzas in the new Pizza Quest book, which will come out next year. So hopefully we'll this one right you. here. There it is. That looks good. Good enough, good enough to eat. Bye-bye, folks. We'll see you next Thanks time. So much. Pizza Quest is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org, and connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at facebook.com slash Heritage Radio Network. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, and more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Thanks for listening.